Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky and welcome back to another episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. Today, I'm very excited to have my friend Bianca Shelley Robinson joining. Bianca, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, I always enjoy our, our conversations and before we hit record here, we were just uh, kind of vibing and exploring what's going on with families and uh, you know our worlds and seems to, to be many connection points. So I mean, yeah, been looking forward to having you on and uh, kind of having you share some of your your story and your experience and how you got to where you are with uh, with everyone here today. Well, I'm really excited too. You're definitely my spirit animal. We vibe very well <laughs> together, and so I'm excited um, to be here. So again, thank you for having me. Yeah, well, let's uh, let's get into it. For those who aren't familiar with you and your work, Bianca, you are the CEO of Caden K Consulting. Uh, K&K is an operational management firm that works with businesses to develop and manage their, their business infrastructure needs. Uh, we're going to get into <clears throat> how you diversified and you know, create a whole digital side to your business. Uh, but you've also worked with some very well-known organizations like MasterCard, Mercedes-Benz, University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, and a whole bunch of, of others that I'm sure people would also uh, be familiar with. So before we kind of get into where your business is today and, and really how you kind of got to, to where you are, Take me back to before you actually started your consulting business. What what were you doing? You know, kind of where did you grow up? Like set the stage so that everybody has an understanding of of your your initial journey before you actually started consulting. Oh, okay. So I before I started this business, I was a business and project manager of an engineer firm, and so I worked there for maybe a couple of years. But when I was in college everybody was trying to find a job and I just really didn't know what I wanted to do. So a recruiter came and he told me that he was the CEO of a temp agency. And I was like, what does that mean for me? He said, you can work at a lot of different corporations and a lot of different places. You'll get a lot of different experience. Mm -hmm. um, but you work Monday through Friday, nine to five weekends off and you get paid every week because I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I just didn't know what, and I knew that I needed that experience. And so I did that for maybe like three years. And so I've had probably like 30 jobs. Like I've worked everywhere except for maybe NASA, but I've worked, you know, a week there, three months there, things of that nature. And so I learned a lot of transferable skills there that I was able mm -hmm. to apply to my business, not knowing that I was really going to need those skills to go to the level that I wanted to go to. So we kind of started there um, first. And then the energy engineer firm, that was actually my first real job that wasn't from the Tim agency. And so I settled in there. And then from there, that's when I started this particular business. And how long did you work at that engineering firm before you decide to go out on your own and you know, start your own business? Two years. So I worked there for two, two years and I started off as just the business manager. And then my project manager, I was helping him with a lot of projects. And he was like, you know, you're really smart. I like what you're doing. You should go back to school and become a project manager so you can make more money. And so I went back to school and got my master's in project management, but I really didn't want to do that at all. I was okay with being um, a business manager, but project management, I fell in love with, and it was I'm really good at telling people what to do and giving orders. And so it kind of just made sense for me to <laughs> yeah. go that route and also get paid well to do it. But I worked there for, for two years and then I transitioned. And my first business I started was uh, a bookkeeping business. Like I hate bookkeeping with a passion, but nine out of 10 businesses, their back of house is just not in order. And so mm. when I quit that job, I quit on a really big bookkeeping contract. I had got certified. The accountant had taught me everything. And so um, I believe in starting profit-based businesses first, not passion-based businesses. And so I really knew I wanted to eventually become the job that I left, but I didn't know how to run a business, how to upsell, how to cross-sell. I didn't know any of that. And so mm. I just believe in not starting on a thing that I absolutely positively want because you start to think that maybe I'm not good at it. Maybe, you know, I don't like it, but it's just because you're not prepared and ready yet to be able to, you know, do what you want to do within that field. And so I knew that coming from Tempin that I had to transfer a different way. Let's, I, I want to unpack some of that or kind of dig a little bit deeper because you just said something that might rattle a few people and, and maybe just like skim or like went in one ear and out the other for a lot of people. You said that you believe it's important to start profit-based businesses before you get in, before you kind of start thinking about passion. And yet so often people hear that you, you really need to be passionate about your business, lead with passion, you know, identify your passions and then build around that. 
just just kind of make that distinction and for me and, and share with with all, everyone here a little bit more about your thinking about the the connection and distinction between profit based businesses and passion based businesses. Uh, when it's a passion, you'll do it for free. And so a lot of times when it's a passion, we do. And so we don't charge correctly. We don't have the right type of clientele. Um, we fall in love with the client, but not the products and the services, but the client can change. But if you start a profit-based business, this is a skill set that I have. I can use this. People already seem value in it. I was hired to do this already. And so you know that it can make money. I believe in starting that first and understanding mm -hmm. how to phase in and phase out of it. It's not what I want to do long term, but it will give me the stepping stools that I need to get me to where I'm trying to go. So I believe in starting a profit based business. You're going to see profit because you've already did it before already. So it's something that's not new to you. So mm -hmm. it kind of is second nature, but also don't get boggled down and just stand in the passion and the profit-based business. Like you want to transition that so that you can eventually do what you love, but it doesn't happen like that in the beginning for most people. Right. We're going to get into how you've, you know, built your business to uh, where it is today. And, you know, you have a team and for everyone who's more advanced or has a more established consulting business, I think they're going to get a lot out of what you're going to share coming up. Um, but before we, we go there, for those who are, who are new, who might still be working or who are very early stage, just talk about what was going on for you, like emotionally, mindset wise, making the leap from working in kind of an established company as an employee to actually going out and starting your, your own business. Like, did you feel a lot of risk? Was that just a natural transition for you? How are you thinking about that before you actually, you know, made that leap to, to start your own thing? Well, it's funny because um, me and my fiance at the time, we had had the conversation about me wanting to, because I was doing it on the side and making a little bit of money about it. Mm -hmm. um, but he said like, hey, I can support us for a year. So you can do this thing for a year. You don't have to worry about anything like I'm prepared to take care of us. Well, we had that conversation on like a Monday and then Friday, he ended up having to get emergency brain surgery and he was off work nine months, no pay. So my wow. little, my little, business that was just supposed to be extra money it ended up having to really step up to pay for all of our needs and wants my daughter was like four months we had just bought a house like it was just a lot of things that was going on and so in my mind I had a year to figure it out but I didn't I had to kind of jump in there um, and take care of our household so I really didn't have the time to really mm -hmm you know, think like most people would think because it was just really survival mode to make sure that I was able to hold down our household and us to stay afloat. So it was really, I'm glad I started a profit-based business because I needed all of the profit right. yeah. then. And so it kind of worked out in our favor that I didn't start this business, which that I have now that I absolutely wanted because I didn't even know how to upsell. I didn't, I didn't know all of that, but I knew bookkeeping. I knew that I knew I could be a taskmaster and do bookkeeping. And so I'm glad I actually went that route, but I didn't have the luxury of kind of figuring it, figuring it out like most people. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so interesting how sometimes that stress and pressure that one person looks at as a really negative, you know, terrible situation can actually create results and outcomes that you wouldn't have expected by, by looking at it from, at a different perspective. But why in that moment, when you found out that your fiance at that time uh, needed to have surgery, right? And you had so much on the line, why not just kind of go back to the safety of, of getting a full-time job? Why did you keep pushing and, and building the business? So it was my daughter because my husband couldn't watch my daughter and then we didn't have care. So I had to be able to facilitate me having to take care of him and take care of my daughter and be able to take care of my bookkeeping clients. So he was able to watch her for maybe a couple hours. So I would go out, business, prospect, come back home and then do the work. But if he was okay, I probably would have went to get a job, but I didn't yeah. have the time or the family or the resources or the money for daycare to even be able to pay for that. So it was just kind of out of necessity that I had to do it that way. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I really hope everybody's thinking about their situation. And, you know, when you encounter something that you feel is uh, just heavy resistance or a challenge, just, just think about what Bianca is sharing here today, because I mean, th this is testament to powering through and, and how we can all achieve more than we probably initially believe that we can. Um, so let's fast forward now a little bit. You know, you, you move the, this bookkeeping business forward before you actually started your, your consulting company. Uh, did you have other, other businesses, other projects? Like walk us through what, what that looked like just to the point of actually then going and starting the consulting business. Um, so when I, 
started the bookkeeping business, three companies that I work with from my corporate job ended up finding me on LinkedIn because the project had like totally fell apart. And so I started off in government procurement because I was doing that in my corporate job. And so I wasn't certified yet. I didn't have the MBE and the WB and all of those things, but I was a contractor on these particular projects. And so mm. I worked those projects for maybe three or four years. Like they bought me more business. And so I kind of used that to facilitate my pipeline to be able to keep the business afloat. But then I started bookkeeping. I knew I hated it. I transitioned out of that in like 18 months. And so I knew that my objective when I started the bookkeeping, I wanted to get testimonials. I wanted to get case studies. I wanted to mm-hmm. do white papers. Like I had a whole plan of what this business was going to bring me. And mm-hmm. so then I transitioned out of that. And then I started to do career development because I was really good at resumes and helping people get jobs. And so I used that and that really helped me to learn how to write better case studies, better white papers, things of that nature, because my writing skills got really good. And so I was doing that transition out of that for maybe like 11 months. And then I started to coach. I had this program called the Employerpreneur Program. I was already helping people with their resumes anyway. And so I helped them to start their side business while they were still working their nine to five. So I'm good. I'm good at transitioning and phasing people into what I'm currently doing. Um, so because I took my bookkeeping clients and then I helped them get government contracts and then I took my career development clients and then I helped them start their own business. And so now that they have their own business and they're working their nine to five, okay, let's quit that so you can be full time. And so a lot of my people in the beginning, they they've been with me during my transition of the ups and the downs and pivoting and things of that nature. And so I have a very strong clientele base that I built over the past 10 years. What do you think is like, what's your approach to communicating with, with your client base? I think, you know, very often consultants, they'll deliver on a project when they're working with a client, but they don't do a very good job of maintaining that client long-term. And it it sounds like you've been pretty intentional uh, to bring your clients with you to always find new, new value or new services that you could offer them, right. That that would be valuable for them. How how do you think about that? How do you um, communicate that to the current and, and past clients. So every month we have this coffee chat and it's the third, it's the fourth Friday of every single month. And so I invite all of my clients, whether they bought digital products, corporate clients, whatever the case might be, we have like this really big coffee chat. And it's kind of like a networking event where I tell them what I have going on, some new clients, some ups and downs, and also introduce everyone. And so Mm -hmm. that's kind of how I I started. It just kind of started with, hey, I have some free time. Let me just do a coffee chat. And then it became like, is the coffee chat happening this month? Is the coffee chat happening this month and so I've been doing these coffee chats for like eight years and it's been the same time um and so that's how I'm able to tell them what I'm working on how I'm transitioning even clients that I have that could be beneficial to them like hey I want you to meet such and such this is her like let me put you in a private room and so I've kind of been that network hub um for my clients to find new clients but also for me to be able to get reoccurring clients and and how many people tend to come on one of these coffee chats um, maybe like 400. Okay. So you have a lot of people coming on and then yeah, it was 400 are- and now it's probably like maybe 2000 because I've mixed my digital lower tier products with my higher tier people. And so I've mixed them together. So okay. probably like 2000 now I've mi- I've mixed everybody together. So they, so they, so you have, you have over a thousand people, 2000 people come on and you're just sipping a coffee, just talking about like what you're doing, what's going on. It's, is there a real structure to these calls that you're having? Yeah, so some of my clients that I've had that month, I use that for them to give their testimony about how we work together and how I've helped them and also to showcase their area of expertise. Because Mm -hmm. now I have these pool of people that come from all different walks of life because we do sell lower tier and mid tier digital products. So they can get those clients too. Mm -hmm. And so whoever was the client of that month, it's kind of like a fireside chat where I'll have a conversation with them and then I'll open it up um, for networking. And so that's been the flow since the pandemic. So the, the value, because I think people are probably who are joining us right now and, and listening going, okay, that sounds like an interesting concept. It's almost kind of like a virtual round table, mm-hmm. but, but what's the value? And especially if let's say you're thinking about a, a senior decision maker, right? Somebody in an organization, not just a, a solo, you know, uh, business owner or freelancer or whatever, right? So somebody, let's say that, that is working in a more established, larger organization, what would be the value for them to actually show up to, to one of these chats? 
Um, a lot of times, a lot of my smaller tier clients, they have a lot of employee customer benefits that they offer to corporations. And so one of my clients has a tutoring firm. And so one of the major corporations wanted to actually implement that into their business. And so they mm. partnered together. And so now that's the employee um, benefit package. Another one, some of them have catering companies. And so that's another employee benefit that they add to it. And so they listen to these different things to be able mm -hmm. to add to their business and their clients. And also like it helps them with their community initiative that they came. Like they write a lot of um, case studies and monthly newsletters talking about my actual event that they came to. And so it's yeah. something that is out of the norm for them and they wouldn't normally do um, things of that nature. But since I do it every single month, it piqued their curiosity. And now like they love it. I have uh, Fortune 500 company CEOs that come to my events just because of it's fun, it's exciting, it's an hour, um, and they get to let their hair down and really talk to people that they normally wouldn't talk to to pique their interest. What do you do if it's me? They can't let your hair down. What, <laughs> how, how does that work? Yeah, come on now. Um, so I, I think that the big thing, right, the real takeaway that I, I want to um, really spotlight here is you've been doing this for eight years, right? Like consistently every month, this is happening. So often people will try something like this, might be completely different, like something on social or a different kind of webinar or whatever. They, they try in direct mail. They try something where they stop when they don't get the result working right away. And, and I'm sure, I mean, you can speak to this. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but were there times when you were starting this where it didn't really feel like there was much traction to it or did it just like work perfectly out of the gate? Um, so when I first started it, it was probably like me and maybe three of my clients, but I used that to, okay, let's perfect our elevator pitch. Like let's perfect our ideal client and our target market, our value mm -hmm. proposition. So I used it when it wasn't that many people there to really perfect my skill set and my craft. And that's how I started to create digital products because people wasn't showing up, but I had a small audience. So let me record this and repackage it and sell it. And so that's how, how the digital product form kind of started from there. Got you. Yeah. So with your client base, like when you then transition more into formally saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to create this consulting company, K and K, right. Operational kind of management firm, um, right. Helping companies in many different ways as, as you've done, how did you get your initial clients and, and not even just initial, I know you said like some came from LinkedIn or some were bookkeeping clients beyond that. Like once that, once you kind of had a first few clients through the door, where did the next clients, like what, what did you find at that time was working best from a marketing perspective to actually attract more of these kind of higher value consulting clients? So I took my, all of the bosses that I had at the temp agencies that I had, and I sent out an email blast and told them what I was doing. And mm. they were actually my first people because I knew that they did contract work because I was a contractor. And so I knew the workload um, that it entailed. And so I turned those companies that were major fortune 500 companies they were my first clients because we worked together in such a small a, a big capacity before like yeah. I was their assistant while their assistant was out of town or I was the accounts payable person while their main person was out of town mm -hmm. so I had direct connections with the c-suite employees and so it was an easy transition for me because I tempt for so long my Rolodex was nice right yeah I mean I think there's, there's so much power in that and it's one of these very simple things that you can do, like just letting people that you already have a relationship know, even if it's not the strongest relationship, like I'm sure you weren't necessarily um, sitting down for lunch or, or, you know, having regular communication with many of these people that you worked with over the years, but there was at least some relationship. Like they know, they remembered who you were when they got your email, right? So many people have that opportunity and they don't do much with it. And so I want to encourage everybody right now who's listening to this, you know, think about who have you not had a conversation with in the last four weeks, six weeks, you know, six months, 12 months, like whatever it might be. And like reach out to those people because that, that could create a conversation that could turn into business for you. Um, in terms of your, your business. So you mentioned that you're providing these services, right? You're running these chats uh, once a month and you're finding that there's a lot of value in what you're doing, but people aren't necessarily always showing up. And so that was kind of the, the starting point to, to uh, digitize or to create these digital, digital products. Can you talk a little bit more about what that was like, that process of taking what so many people provide in terms of like services and, and deliverables to actually packaging them in digital form and then offering them to a much broader audience. Like how did you kind of make that transition? 
Um, I'm really good at, I, this no longer serves me. I don't want to do it anymore, but I still want to have the impact. So I'm really good at doing something for a couple of months and then turning that into a digital product. I've come to realize that I am dedicated to the education, but I'm not dedicated to being there when it finally hits for the clients. Mm. Like I'm not dedicated to the transformation when it finally hits um, for you because it could take three months it could take six months like it could take a year but I want to give you this information and so that became my thing where my information is the same but how I deliver it is different so one month I might want to do an intensive next month I might turn it into a mini course another month it might be an in-person workshop but I got really good at taking what was working and mm. figuring out how I can diversify this on um, multiple levels and so it started off with me just teaching elevator pitch because I was teaching pitch competitions and I believe your elevator pitch is like one of the most essential tools needed in your business and all businesses need it. And so I started to teach that a lot and I started to help people win pitch competitions. And then I got tired of doing it. And I was like, you know what? I can just record this, put this in digital product form and just give it to the masses. So my first mm -hmm. product that I did um, was elevator pitch because I believe in collecting the data and then segmenting the data from there. And so let right. me do something that is blanketed that all businesses would need. And we work with um, those in professional services, but I get a lot of people that's not in professional services, but I sell digital products that is for all businesses. So let me throw the net to collect the data and then mm. kind of segment it from there. So yeah, I want to get into your, what kind of like really what you mean when you say segment the data and what you learn from, from that process. Um, I think some people might be listening to you right now going like, okay, Bianca, but like, that sounds, first of all, like you're really busy. Uh, it sounds like you're creating a ton. Uh, and it also sounds like, you know, you're maybe, maybe it's not focused, like it just in terms of like, maybe it's not man that manageable because you're creating a lot of different things for a lot of different people. How, how do you see it? How do you kind of make sure that you do stay focused uh, and that you're, you know, you're building the brand in the way that you want and not just putting a ton of stuff out there that may or may not actually be good for the long term? So we are operational management firm. And so how are we an operational management firm? We have three core focuses, which is business consultant, project management, and business development. And so I believe that you should have a business that supports the personal life that you desire. And so let's figure out what the personal life is and let's wrap a business model around that that supports that. And so I am that walking brand of I live this lifestyle. I have the seven figure business, but I run it differently than most people. So I was able to figure out my three core focuses and put the trainings in the buckets where they should where they should go. Mm. And so that's how I stay focused. Um, if I'm doing a training, like I just did one on value proposition and core competencies, well, that's business development. And so that goes in that particular bucket. And so mm. do I want to turn that into a digital product or do I want to keep that as a live intensive? Do I want to make that into a challenge? And so I created first live. So it's always a live training first. And from that live training, then the client comes to me and say, Hey, I want you to help build that for me. Or, Hey, I want you to teach this to my employees. And so I do it first. And then based on what they need determines how I package it, but I don't package it. I have a team that packages. It. I just give the information right. and then they pack it, they package it accordingly. And then how, I mean, so today, right. You have a list of I'm sure many thousands of people that you, when you send out an email, right, you can, you can make offers to them and you, you built that relationship with them. But in the early days, when you created these products and whether it was, um, you know, a workshop that you would deliver live or an, an in-person, or it was a digital kind of product that you put together, who are you selling that to? Like, were you driving advertising traffic from Facebook or some other platform to get people to buy? Or how did you go about actually getting pe enough people to purchase these products and offerings to, to make it profitable and worthwhile for you? So as of this year, we have been in business for 10 years and I don't invest in ads. And so it's really been me being transparent with my audience and growing my large social media following and being able to help them and funnel them. I'm all about the repeat clientele. And so 82% um, of our clientele is repeat clientele. And so I'm very much into feeding the people that we already have. And then mm. they're bringing people to me because I do trainings a lot. So it's like, hey, you pay for this, but invite a guest to come. Like invite them to be able to come. And so I use my resources that I have. And from there, they help me facilitate that. But I also do, I'm really big on municipalities. Um, I learned that in my corporate job um, that municipalities, they have the money, whether it's a small municipality or a big municipality, most people don't realize. 
utilize that. And so mm-hmm. I do a lot of trainings for municipalities. Well, in that municipality, it's a corporation. And so they get the e-blasts and the emails. Sometimes I teach classes at the libraries. Well, the library is free, but it's a database of millions of libraries that my training goes out to. And they have their own society as well. And so Mm -hmm. I've been really good about using those municipalities to be able to facilitate my offer and my clientele. And so, and it's free. I don't have to pay for that. Right. And so- Somebody's going, okay, I, I love that idea, Bianca. Like, yeah, I want to go and give talks to municipalities and therefore get in front of organizations and, you know, have my, my expertise uh, promoted out, you know, into a much larger kind of, um, you know, distribution set. How do you, how do you go about that? What's, what's your recommendation for somebody who has expertise and they want to tap into their local municipality or state or whatever it is? How, do you just send an email to the executive director or to a program administrator? What's, what's the process to actually start to, to get some uh, traction there? So I figure out when someone else is having a training next there and I'll attend the training because the decision maker is at that particular training. And then um, we'll have a conversation from there. And then I'm always, hey, I know that you have this coming up. I know it's last minute. Can I just do a 15 minute training um, and you insert me in this particular training? And so nine times out of 10, it works because I'm only asking for 15 minutes, but I'm doing that to showcase my area of expertise so I can eventually get my own training day. So mm. I hop on, I hop on a lot of people days. Like I don't want a whole day. I only need 15 minutes. Like, can I get 15 minutes? Well, what's the blanketed topic that I teach elevator pitch value proposition core competencies, you know, things of that nature, because all businesses need them. And so once mm. I get them in, then I can segment them to where they need to, where they need to go. Got you. So on the segmentation side, you mentioned that for you, you're very big in terms of just putting stuff out there, right? Getting the data, deciding how to segment. Can you talk a little bit more about kind of your, your mindset around that and the strategy or the decisions that you make? Like, what do you really mean when you say get a lot of data segment based on that? Give me, give me an example of how you've applied that into your business. Um, so we're about to do this training on kind of the five core focuses I believe all businesses should have um, this particular year to take them to the next level. And so it's all businesses. So even though from an ideal client perspective, I only work with those in professional services. My target market is anybody that wants to start growing scale a business because we have those digital products. So mm-hmm. when I do this mass class, a lot of people are going to sign up for the class. From that class, my funnels is already set up like, hey, you don't even have to come to this class if it doesn't pertain to you. These are the things that we offer. These are our case studies. These are our white papers. Like click the one that best supports your situation. Once they click it, we already have the funnels already set up for them to go into their perspective um, area. I always have the serve, serve, sell emails. Um, We have emails that go out three times a week. And so they're scheduled for the entire year. So it depends on where you go. It determines Mm. what emails you get, but it's already set up already where it's, um, a tip, it's a white paper, it's a case study, it's a testimonial, it's just showcasing us in the light of being an expert. And so once they go through that funnel, then they can pick and choose if they want to work with us or not, or if they want to buy a digital product. But right. all I have to do is catch them to get them in the net. From there, the systems in the back end does it on their own. Gotcha. So just to, to make this very tangible uh, for everyone, what you're saying is, you know, you will, you'll send some emails to people, um, let's say about a a workshop you might be holding when somebody gets that email it's going to give them a whole bunch of options uh when they click one of those options number one that tells you and your team that that person is interested in in a specific topic but then in addition to that you have your automation set up so that uh, additional emails will be sent to that person about that specific topic so they get more relevant emails right so it's more personalized for them but you're also getting data to see okay we had 100 people come through this and let's say 54% of them, right? 54 people click this one specific topic. That tells us like there's a lot of interest in this specific topic. Maybe we should do more and put out more content, social media posts, whatever it is, like just kind of go deeper into what the market actually wants. Is that correct? Yes. So if 54 people clicked it, let's do it. Let's do a training on that this week. Okay. Well, from the training, what's the upsell? Let's do a two day intensive for those people that come through here. And so we look at the data Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And so we do that at the end of the day um, Mm -hmm. before we go home. And so we have that data. So I'm very on top of the information that comes in to know based on the trend that happened this week, what should we put out? Right. You mentioned that um, repeat clientele is a really big thing in your business. 
any best practices, tips, just things that you found have really worked, like had a, a big impact in helping to, to have more repeat clients that you would recommend for somebody who also wants to improve in that area? So when they come into the net, they get these questions. From these questions, it's information that can help me. What's your goals within the next 90 days? The last person that you worked with, like what did they love? What did you love the most about them? Like, tell me about your ideal client. Like, how did that work out? And so I'm asking these clarifying questions mm -hmm. because if 10 people have the same goal for the next 30 or 90 days, I can simply reach out to them and say, hey, I'm doing an intensive. I want to put you guys together in this particular group. Um, and so I'm able to always refunnel the funnel of the people. And so I believe that once you come in, I have what it is that you need. And if I don't, I have this coffee chat every single month where you'll find the person that it is that you're looking um, that you're looking for. So we became this resource mm -hmm. hub for a lot of our clients, um, but also for us too. Like I don't have to fish for clients like most people do because I'm just refunneling the same clients that I already have already. Right. How many team members do you have today? Um, so we have three full-time employees, including me, and then I have five contractors. Got you. Um, how do you stay on, on top of like everyone? So you have, you do have a lot going on, and your your business model um, from the from an outside perspective, it's not as simple as like, hey, we just have one program or or one thing going on, right? You have multiple offerings, uh, right? So lots of moving pieces, and obviously you've structured it in a way that for you it feels, I would imagine, still like manageable and right. Things are are moving along yeah. well. What, what's the key to, to that? How do you make sure that, that everybody on your team, so eight total people, including you, that everything is moving forward the way that it should be, that you know, progress is being made? What kind of, I know you have the, some, the PMP background as well. Like what's, what's the key to making all that work from, from your experience? And we have a focus every single month. And so we're always going to do a two-day intensive. I, I have more customers now than clients because our, digital, our business model is 90% digital and 10% service. Of that 10%, 8% is our government and corporate contract. And then 2% is just small businesses like you and I. And so I've been really good about vetting the ideal client to come over here so that we can work with them. But most of our money now, we're doing trainings, we're helping other clients do trainings. And so it runs systematically because we only offer four core offers even though it sounds like a lot, it's only four offers that we have. You're either going to get them in a digital product form or a service form. So we only offer um, four things. But being clear on the flow for the week um, has really helped us understand the mm. framework for the entire month. Like we have, we do profit plans every single month. And so I do them with all of my clients too. If we're talking about the coffee chat, like I do a really big profit plan to show you how to understand just, your just numbers. Just describe, sorry to interrupt, Bianca, but explain for everybody like, when you say profit plan, what, what is that? Um, so you know your goal that you want to make for the year. So maybe your goal is to make a million dollars. Well, I'm into cult brands. So C-U-L-T, I'm a cult brand fanatic. And so the reason why we buy into cult brands is because they have a mission. So yeah, you want to make a million dollars, but how does that help other people? So what's the mission behind that? And so our mission is um, for this year is we want to help 10,000 service-based professionals to be able to add at least an additional $10,000 a month to their overall bottom line. So I know that mission. How do I know that? Because I know the products and services that I need to sell every single month in order to make that um, particular number happen and so we break the mission down by month and mm -hmm. from that month what's the product or service that you're selling this month and before we try to go get new people let's do our repeat clientele flow to see if we already have somebody that already gave us some money to be able to help us with that so we do our yeah. profit plan every single month and so we're in alignment with it every single week when we do our weekly trainings um, and our weekly meetings and so that's how we stay on task is from the plan yeah I, mean, I think that's so important we've We've done something very similar over the years with with clients where you know we have them reverse engineer like what do you want to be achieving and part of that of course is financial but when you kind of back reverse engineer you start to get very clear on like how many conversations do you actually need to have every single week how many leads do you need to create those number of conversations um, and then you end up having one number that you just become very very focused on and if you do that you do it consistently good things tend to happen so uh, I'm, I'm with you on that so you okay so you have eight people on your team. Walk us through how, how did you go about hiring those people? Like, what was the the plan? Who did you hire first, and and then how do you kind of what do your next few hires look like? 
Um, so since I come from a bookkeeping background, I know that that's the most important person on the team. Even if you don't make the type of money that you want, we're in business to make money. And so we need to be able to have a place where we can use this money and to organize it so we can know if mm. we can hire a team and what those expenses look like. And so people ask me that all the time. I tell them you should hire a bookkeeper first. I know you don't have the money right now, but if you have them set it up, and show you how to do it when the money does come you'll be in a better position and so I think the bookkeeper uh was my first hire since I knew that coming from um bookkeeping and then somebody to support me so it was my um assistant like I believe and we have um a hybrid model where it's productized you know firm model um digitized like we have a hybrid business model based on how the money comes in but I don't need another me I need somebody to just support me and be in me um and so my assistant was the first person that I hired and from my assistant um she hired the other people like hey we're doing all of this I see the need for these particular things mm. um and so we have a communication manager since we do do a lot of digital products and we do do a lot of white papers and case studies I need somebody to take my thoughts and to make them make sense so we have a communications manager um that's in charge of helping with the content and the copy social media is a really big platform for me and so I need a social media manager to be able to run it and facilitate it then we have a web designer um too because we put out courses and classes all the time so I need you to facilitate this and um, mm -hmm. then we have a data analyst our data analyst is the one that um, helps us when we are pitching they pull the list segment the data um and we use that and then i have a cfo um and then one other person is my operationals uh, manager and so it's a lot of us but everybody knows their particular role it was never my goal to be um a big company with a lot of employees like a lot of my clients are in tech and so they make nine ten figures and it's six full-time people on their team but the rest of them is contractors and so I came from that when I mm -hmm. worked in my corporate job it was me the CEO um one other person and we had a lot of different contractors and so I like that model and I've seen it be done and so I want to stay clear and stick to um the particular model that we have when you think about your team and just the the hiring uh experience that you have what do you feel is one key thing that is is just critical to hire but also potentially to, to retain um you know great people um i've learned not to hire in the season that i need those people um because when you need those people you're pressed and stressed and so every little mistake they make you're stressed out and you're upset i know how our business flows like we just hired a person i need her for the end of the year but i don't want to hire her in the end of the year when i actually really need her mm. um and so i've learned to hire early and train early so many of our good people but we're not good trainers and we're not good bosses not because we don't want to be but we have so many other things going on that we haven't given them the proper tools um that they need to be able to be successful and so i started that off um, in the beginning, hiring all these people and not being able to properly manage them and help them. And so I hire them in the season where I don't need them. And so we sell a lot of things to build our reserve. So we have a reserve fund that we use so that now I am hiring these people. They're not able to produce, but I'm not stressed out to where, oh my God, am I going to make payroll? Like the money is low, cash flow is low. Like we build a reserve. And so every single month, based on what we do, we take a percentage and we keep putting it into the reserve. Mm. When you look back at your experience of transitioning from delivering just kind of like, you know, 100% services and, and deliverables to shifting a lot of your knowledge and expertise uh, online and then packaging these products and making them available to, as you said, many different types of, of businesses out there. Uh, what's one thing that you, you think, hey, like, actually, I, I should have done that differently. Or if I was doing this again, like I would have done it differently. Or if I was going to advise somebody who's going to be doing the same kind of transition that, you know, you need to look out for this or pay attention to, to that. What stands out for you? I think um, the systems, because we are a system based business. And so understanding your simple workflow and the system will take you way farther. A lot of people have a person that is um, an hourly employee that a system can do. And so you haven't learned the system enough to be able to take that person that is now a taskmaster to use their ability to be able to help you. And so I'm all mm -hmm. about what's the system that we're going to use? Like, what's the end goal? If we go from the house, which is your goal that you think is my job to bring you back to the dirt so we can figure out how we can get to this house. So understanding their objections 
and figuring out what system works best and what system will support our growth. Like you might learn this system, but it doesn't have the ability to scale the business. So let's start with this version and figure out how it can take us to the next level. So understanding the system. Yeah. Can you give me an example of like one system where, or one scenario where you've done that in your business where you had somebody who was working kind of an hourly and then maybe a system could have replaced or, or just taken their output to that next level? Yeah, so we do a lot of email marketing. So I had someone actually, every client that came in to call them, to welcome them. And so one 10 minute call turned into two hours on the phone talking to this one person. And so what we do is when the client comes in 30 minutes before we leave, we're recording a quick video like, hey, Michael, I thank you for joining. You know, I want to let you know what's going on in the portal. These are the information. You know, if you have any questions, let us know, but you'll be on Bianca's schedule next week to talk about it. This is the particular day. And so taking that and still adding the uh, the human component, because we sell mm -hmm. a lot of digital, but the human component is why we sell so much because they know, even if I do a training and it's a digital training, I'm going to do a live Q&A session at the end of the month for this training to answer your questions, comments, um, and concerns. So having someone to call all of these people when just been 30 minutes, you might be able to record 12 videos because they're only one to two minutes um, and still give them that personal touch. Um, kind of took our business to the next level because now I was giving this person their time back and not having them do manual labor and be a taskmaster when our $45 a month system could do that. Yeah, no, it's amazing. We've we've definitely seen that over the years, that that human touch to just, you know, one of our values, we say La Familia, like it's, we're not, we're not Spanish, you know, but uh, it's just like, it's that family vibe, but we really care. We really want to work as closely as we possibly can with, with everybody that comes into the community and, uh, and that we have an opportunity to work with. So I I, I, yeah, I feel you on that. I think that's uh, incredibly important and very missed or, or mm -hmm. not as present as, as it could and should be these days. So before we, we wrap up, Bianca, I, I know you have, you know, you have, you have young kids, you have this growing business, you got lots of good stuff going on. W what do you feel are like one or two habits uh, that, that play a big role in, you know, in your life? Uh, so it might be on the business side, maybe it might be more on the personal kind of lifestyle side, but what do you just feel like two things or, or even one thing that you just, you go to and you do every day or at least several times a week that are really connected to you being able to perform at a higher level, to be productive, to be focused, to be, you know, to be your best. Um, for me, it's really understanding what type of personal life do I want in this particular season? And does my business model support that? Um, so many times we're, we're not willing to change our business model and I am dedicated to the information, but not how I deliver the information. And so um, in the summer, like Q3, I don't work with clients. Like I'm outside enjoying my kids um, being out of school for the summer. So we travel a lot, but I know that my systems and processes have to be in order because I'm going to be doing a lot of customer service and running my business um, from my laptop. And so really just understanding that the information that I want to give is great, is valuable, but I can switch it up how I give it and still be in alignment with what our mm. mission and our vision um, is. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not married to the delivery, but I'm married to the information, but not how we give um, the information. And so I'm able to touch so many different people because I'm not like, oh, this is a, a, a individual service, so it has to be done this way. Like. Oh, it's the summertime people are outside traveling they're not going to be in an intensive for eight hours for two days let's just go ahead and turn it into a mini series and then throw a Q&A into it and so I'm able to do that you know mm -hmm. based on what's going on in my per in my personal life I'm able to adjust it and so that's what we're about figuring out what your what type of personal life do you want to have and now that you know that for this season, what business model supports that personal mm. life so that you can have the quality of life and make the money and live the life that you desire? Do you do you spend time like every day or every week reflecting on that? Like I know a lot of people do journaling or meditation or is there any kind of practice that you have that, that you use to make sure that you're still in alignment and you're going in the right direction? Yeah, so it's funny because we have our team meetings every week, but I also have meetings with my family every single week too. Um, so on my team, we meet every Monday to figure that part out. But on Sundays, it's my entire immediate family. That's about 10 of us. And we have meetings on Sunday and figure out like, what's the goal? What's the plan? How can we adjust? You know, what is it that you need? How can I support? And I'm the oldest, but you would think that I am the baby because I'm the only one with kids. So it's how can we support you? Because I do help, you know, my, my immediate family. So do you, are you going out of town? Do you need a babysitter? Do you need help with the workshops? Like, what is it that you need? And so it's pretty much the Bianca show every Sunday because- <laughs> 
I'm the one with the business. And so I'm the one that helps a lot of my family members. And so how can we support you and help you be great so that you can continue to to do this? And so that has really been kind of key to me taking my business and growing it at the level that I have because I do those check-ins with my team and also with my family every single Sunday. We're, we're going to have uh, your website and social profiles. I'll get you to send them over afterwards because I know there's a, there's a bunch of them and you're, you're active in those places. So it'd be good for people to have an opportunity to, to see what you got going on there. Uh, yes. But before we wrap up, I mean, in the last, whether it's six months, 12 months, uh, any, any books that you've really found uh, to be helpful that you either read or listened to, and just from a resource perspective, you know, where are you going or where are you getting information that you feel is really helpful for you to, to grow your business? Okay, so it's like a shameless plug, but I listen to the podcast all the time. Which, which podcast? <laughs> your podcast. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank yes, you. I listen to the podcast um, all, the, all the time. Um, and so that's really been helping me to, um, when I listen to the podcast, I journal that particular time. I'm like, okay, they said this, like, how can I implement this? Like, what are mm. some things that I can do? And so I'm an avid listener um, of the podcast and the people that you have on the show. Um, I listen to their podcasts too, and I buy all of their books. And so I come here first to get the information because I know you're going to give me the right information and then I funnel it um, from there. But I have two membership programs. So we have a book club. And so I'm reading a book every single month. Um, I'm reading A Slight Edge right now. I just got to reading the Floyd Mayweather book. Um, before that, um, I was reading, um, I think his name is Sarbury something. It's a sales book. Um, okay. and so I'm really into the, the psychology of selling. Um, and okay. so I've been reading a lot of those, but I'm really big on documentaries. Like I watch a lot of documentaries. Um, so we do that on Sundays where we watch a documentary um, for my membership and we have to write about it, to talk about it, to figure out how we can apply this um, to our business. Where are you grabbing your documentaries? Is it Netflix? Is it? Yes. I just okay. watched Halsted. Um, is Halsted um, about how he started this business and then they kind of took it over um, this brand. So I, I, I watch it um, on Netflix, Hulu, all of those different places, but every single week I have to watch a documentary. So I either pick it or my membership picks it, but that's how we stay in alignment with current events and figure out how we can apply it to our business and what are the best uh, practices. So it's podcast first for me, then it's my books, but I'm really big on um, sales books and sales psychology books um, and personal development too. Yeah. So I've been reading a lot since we started this in our membership. Awesome. Well, I, I appreciate that. And uh, always like hearing feedback from people who tune into the podcast here. So uh, Bianca, thank you so much for coming on here today, spending a bit of time kind of sharing your, you know, some of your, your uh, story and, and journey with us. Uh, we'll make sure to link up all the good stuff in the show notes so that people can head on over, check out your work uh, and everything that you have going on and highly encourage people to, to do that. But again, thanks so much for, uh, for spending some time together. And thank you for having me, Michael. Thank you.